This video is going to function as the background information for Monday's lab exercise. The topic is going to be about radioisotopes and radioactive decay. The other day we learned about the concept of isotopes and that isotopes are atoms of the same element with the same number of protons but a different number of neutrons. Some examples would be something such as the carbon-12 atom, which has six protons and six neutrons, and an isotope of carbon-12, carbon-14, which also has six protons, but now differs by having eight neutrons in its nucleus. And it's this same number of protons, but different number of neutrons that would characterize these two things as being isotopes. Some isotopes are radioactive. These particular isotopes that are radioactive are identified as being something known as radioisotopes. Now when we call something a radioisotope, that means that that particular isotope is radioactive. Radioactive is just another way of saying that the nucleus of that particular atom is unstable. Now we're familiar with the expression, a square is a rectangle, but not all rectangles are squares. Same idea with our concept of isotopes. A radioisotope is an isotope, but not all isotopes are radioisotopes. Radioisotopes mean specifically that that isotope is has an unstable nucleus and is radioactive. Now there's several reasons why we'll say a nucleus is unstable or that we would say that that particular nucleus is radioactive. One reason is the nucleus has too many neutrons. A second reason is that we have too many protons are in the nucleus in question. The third reason is the nucleus just gets to be plain too big. The element number 83 bismuth is the last stable nucleus on the periodic table. All elements that come beyond number 83 on the periodic table are radioactive from being just plainly too large. Something we'll use in this lab is a chart that's known as the band of stability. The band of stability is a graph that lets us predict whether or not a particular nucleus will be stable, which would be non-radioactive, or unstable, which would mean that the nucleus is radioactive. Now this little fuzzy region that appears in the band of stability, this area of the graph is where if we plot the number of neutrons for a nucleus versus the number of protons for a nucleus, it'll identify that a nucleus is stable. So if we were to count out our number of neutrons in a nucleus and find out that that would bring us to this area matched up with the number of protons in a nucleus, right here, that would be an indication that this particular nucleus with that number of protons and neutrons is stable or non-radioactive. On the other hand, if we were to count our number of neutrons and protons and plot that and find out that, say, when we count our number of protons and our number of neutrons in a nucleus, that plot brings us right here somewhere off of the band of stability, this would indicate that that particular nucleus is unstable, which would be another way of saying that that nucleus is radioactive for that number of protons and neutrons. When we plot on the band of stability, depending on which side or area the plot falls off of the band of stability, for example, region, for example, region A over here to the left of the band of stability, or over here B, or up here on the top region C, the different areas outside the band of stability will tell us what type of radioactive decay that particular nucleus will go through in its attempt to become stable. Let's first focus on this region identified on the plots as region A. 
up and to the left of the band of stability. This would be if we plotted it and we come out over in this area off the band of stability, indicating the nucleus is unstable. If we end up in this region A, A on the graph is where we have too many neutrons are the issue with why our nucleus is unstable. If something has too many neutrons, the type of radioactive decay it's going to go through is something known as beta decay. Beta decay, we give off something known as beta particles. Now in this, too many neutrons where we go through beta decay, what happens in the nucleus, it's kind of weird, is a neutron spontaneously changes into a proton. Then a beta particle, which is the same thing as an electron, is emitted as a result of that change in the nucleus. And that would be beta decay. An example of an element that goes through beta decay is carbon-14. Carbon-14 has six protons and eight neutrons. That has too many neutrons making its nucleus unstable. So let's go through an example of a beta particle decay. Here we have carbon-14, which is our radioactive element. This little zero minus one with an E, this is the symbol that we use to represent a beta particle. Now what's going to happen here is a new element's going to get formed as a result of this beta particle being emitted from the nucleus of the carbon-14. Now the number, the mass number, will be whatever number plus zero equals 14, so that's going to be 14. The atomic number would be whatever number plus negative one is equal to six. So that'd be seven. Looking at the periodic table, the element with atomic number seven is nitrogen, and that'd be the element that gets formed from carbon-14 going through beta decay. This would then be our equation that shows the process of beta decay, in this case for carbon-14. We have our element we start out with, a beta particle gets eliminated, and then we form a new element as a result of that beta decay. Our next area on the graph is area B, right down in this area where we're off to the right and a little bit below the band of stability. If we were to plot something and it turns out in region B, the type of radiation is known as positron emission, which addresses the issue of there being too many protons within the nucleus. Now in this case, what happens for positron emission is within the nucleus, we'll see that a proton spontaneously changes into a neutron, which lessens the number of protons and increases the number of neutrons. When this change occurs, something kind of strange happens. Something known as a positron gets emitted from the nucleus. Now, a thing that's unusual is a positron is a positively charged antimatter electron, which is really a strange piece of nuclear matter. But that's what gets emitted when the nucleus spontaneously, as a proton, turn into a neutron. Then one of these positrons, which is a positively charged antimatter electron, gets emitted as part of that change. An example of this process would be using the element boron and the specific isotope boron-8. This plus one zero with an E is a symbol that we use to represent a positron being given out by the nucleus. The new element that forms would have mass number eight, because we see that eight plus zero will add up to equal eight, and the atomic number will be four, because four plus one here would add up to equal our five that we started with. The new element that we then make is beryllium, after we go through this positron emission as part of radioactive decay. So this again would be positron emission, which is the radiation from too many protons, which comes from, if we're in this area on the band of stability chart, below and to the right of the band of stability, and then this would be an example of a positron emission reaction. The last area to look at on the band of stability is up at the top here. If we'll notice, the stability region actually comes to a dead end. If we end up above and beyond where it dead ends, the issue is that the nucleus has just become too big to remain stable up here in region C. If something's too big, the type of radiation given off is something known as alpha particles, 
or alpha particle emission. Now an alpha particle, which is given off in the nucleus as too big, is the same thing as a helium nucleus. In fact, if we were, could hold a helium nucleus in our hand and on the other hand hold an alpha particle, they'd look exactly the same. An alpha particle is a chunk of the nucleus that breaks off from the radioactive nucleus. It's too big. And the alpha particle is made up of its two protons and two neutrons. So it's like four little pieces and one chunk have broken off of the nucleus. And that one chunk that's made of two protons and two neutrons is known as an alpha particle. An example of an element that goes through alpha particle decay would be the isotope uranium-238. It's just too big to be stable. This, the HE with a 2 and a 4, is our symbol for representing an alpha particle in one of our equations. The new element that's going to form, the mass number in our new element, 234, be 234 plus 4, adds up to give us 238. 90, the new atomic number, plus 2, would add up to give us 92. So our new element is the element thorium that gets created by uranium-238 going through alpha decay. So this would be an example of an element that's too large, where if we plotted it, it would come out in this upper region on our band of stability, beyond the end of the band of stability. We go through alpha decay, so we give off an alpha particle and form our new element which would be thorium-234. Let's now take a look at our lab we'll be doing. The lab, we're going to model radioactive decay using Skittles. The reason we can do this is because radioactive decay is a 50-50 proposition. Either the element goes through radioactive decay or doesn't go through decay. To represent radioactive decay, we're going to use Skittles. Now, if we look at Skittles closely, we can see Skittles are made where on one side of the Skittle there's an S printed. Whereas on the opposite side of the Skittle, it's completely blank, without an S, lacking an S on that side of the Skittle. Now, what you'll need to do is for you and your lab partner obtain a Dixie cup. The Dixie cup contains a pre-counted number of 100 Skittles. What you're going to do with your Dixie cup of Skittles, go to your lab station, first lay out some paper towels on the lab station, and then you're going to take the Dixie cup and dump the cup out onto the paper towels so that all 100 Skittles tumble out onto the paper towels. Your next step is to look at and examine the Skittles that got dumped out of your Dixie Cup. So take a close look at the Skittles. You're going to count all the Skittles that landed S up, and those go back into your Dixie Cup. All the Skittles that landed S down place off on the side. You're done with those Skittles. What this is representing is those that landed S up are still radioactive elements. And those that landed S down are those represent the atoms that went through radioactive, radioactive decay. Your next step, make sure count all the S up Skittles. Take the S up Skittles and return them back to your Dixie cup again. All those that landed S down are to be removed and set off to the side. Your next step then with the read with the counted S up Skittles in a Dixie cup, dump the Dixie cup out another time onto your paper towels on your lab station. And once again, all the Skittles landed S up get counted and go back into the Dixie cup. All those that landed S down have those and remove them and put off to the side. Those landed S up go back into the Dixie cup, and then once again repeat dumping the cup again, and repeat the process again and again until you get to the point where the number of S up Skittles reaches zero. With each time, make sure to count how many Skittles landed S up prior to returning them to the Dixie cup.
once getting your data for each successive dump of the Skittles, go up to the front board in class and add your data to the class shared class data chart. Once all of the class data is on the class data chart, take out your phones and take a picture of the class data so we have a record of that to use the next day in class.